Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Namo saranto sucedo ye lahudi sammyo sanputoshi. Namo saranto sucedo ye lahudi sammyo sanputoshi. Wushang shen shen wei miao fa bai qian wan jie nan sao yu. 我今见闻得受持, Supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered even in billions of eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Venerable Master, Dhamma friends, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> <coughs> what an inauspicious <laughs> beginning to the lecture. Uh, greet you all with the three sneezes. Good afternoon. My name is Hung Shur. Today is Sunday, December 19th. We're here in the Gold Coast of Queensland, Australia, to share with you another session of exploring the Buddha's Avatamsaka Sutra and finding out about the Bodhisattva path. So if that's what you have come to see, you have found the right YouTube channel, you found the right Zoom network, and the right Buddha hall. So let's begin. Uh, before we start, I'm going to do something, share with everybody. Where do we find it? We find it right there. Acknowledgement that uh, the Kombumeri people of the Ugamba language group practice their spiritual connections to land and to all creation, including all living beings, here in this location for thousands of years. We came later. Today, we acknowledge them as the traditional custodians of this place. We acknowledge with gratitude that we share this land Today, we acknowledge with sorrow the costs of that sharing, and we put our hearts behind the hope that we can move to a place of justice and partnership together. May it be so. Okay. Here's our invocation. We're going to invite the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, the Dharma protectors, the Avatamsaka assembly, to draw near. Please join.
today's text is right here. Bigger? Avatamsaka Sutra, Flower Garland Sutra, 10 stages chapter, otherwise known as 10 grounds chapter. First stage, first ground, talking about bodhisattvas, how they think, how they speak, how they act. We've reached the, the end of this first stage and it's a long wrap up. We're meeting a section of the text that we call boilerplate, meaning it returns with slight changes each stage. This is the first one, this is the foundation, so we're hearing it for the first time, but the uh, pattern stays the same. So it's really interesting to see, it's almost like a refrain um, you wonder in the original, did they sing it? Um, probably did. Uh, if it's a refrain, it repeats. The images repeat, only more challenging, more complex each time. Another level of subtlety and profundity each time. So we're hearing it for the first time. This is the basic, the basic image. Okay, are we ready? Let's, let's jump in. Fozu Disciples of the Buddha, when this Bodhisattva has come to abide on the stage of happiness, by means of the power of great vows, he comes to see many Buddhas. That is to say, he sees many hundreds of Buddhas, many thousands of Buddhas, many hundreds of thousands of Buddhas, many millions of Buddhas, many hundreds of millions of Buddhas, many thousands of millions of Buddhas, many hundreds of thousands of millions of Buddhas, many millions of Nayutas of Buddhas, many hundreds of millions of Nayutas of Buddhas, many thousands of millions of Nayutas of Buddhas, many hundreds of thousands of millions of Nayutas of Buddhas. So, Boy, that's a uh, pattern. We heard the words for 10 times. We heard do multiple. Then we heard a progression by, by, qian, yi, 100,000. Uh, some people say an e different. How, how many, Cliff, what is an e for you? E, e, do, sha. 10 million. 100 million. 100 million. Okay, so three zeros plus is three zeros plus three zeros more. There are six, yeah. Um, and that pattern repeats, and we get a Sanskrit numeral, Nayuta. I, Nayuta is a number that has a name, like we say 100, you think two zeros. Thousand, trillion, billion, we've got numbers that have names. So in Sanskrit, which was a profoundly mathematical, uh, a culture that the mathematics for whom uh, was deeply expressed and investigated. So in other words, what happens? Here, when the Bodhisattva gets to this place called the stage of happiness, because of the vows that he or she has made from their heart, the promises to, to do things, they're kind of their marching orders their compass heading, that's what vows are. I'm going that way. I will get there. That's what a vow says. Something happens and Buddhas appear. And then we get to count them <laughs> a lot. 
a lot, a lot of Buddhas up here. So what do you do with that? Um, how many Buddhas have you seen today? <laughs> how many Buddhas have I seen today? Mm. So the question would be, would I recognize if a Buddha showed up? This whole paragraph is about lots of Buddhas showing up. So clearly they've got an appearance and this Bodhisattva recognizes them. So the question to ask here, and mind you, we are reading this part of the sutra for literature. We're reading it to hear the language. We're reading it to catch the ideas, not necessarily to analyze. But since I last looked into this text, which was years and years ago, uh, we went all the way from one to 10. Now we're coming back to one, to gears to get here. I have uh, refined my idea of what to do when we hear the word Buddha, uh, if we're talking to a Western, or yeah, if we're talking to a contemporary audience, no matter where it is, West or East. What is that? The thing to say is, what's a Buddha to you? How do you see the Buddha? And my goodness, you ask 100 people, you get 100 different answers. Um, this, I think, is worthwhile. This is valuable because we don't want to assume everybody knows what we're talking about. Um, somebody would say, uh, uh, you know, if I said, who's the Buddha to you? How do you vision the Buddha? Some people would say, well, I, I, my grandma has a Buddha on her altar. That's who it is. It's that statue over there on the altar. Uh, other people would say, Buddha looks like this. In the rain. Other people say, no, 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 that's an arhat. That's not a Buddha. Some people say, oh, a Buddha would look like this. There he is. He's got funny hair. He's got funny thing on his head. Right? Some people would identify the Buddha that way. Others would say, uh, let's see here. Got some more Buddhas. Uh, some people say, look, who's that? Uh, it's a bodhisattva. Uh -huh. Okay, good for you. You recognize they are not the same. Uh, I'm looking for a particular. Well, here's, here's what Buddhas sit on. If you see the lotus, you should find the Buddha. <laughs> we, got, we got the Buddha's seat. Buddhas sit on lotuses. So we'd recognize that way, right? Uh, I believe we've got a Buddha image here. If not, I know where to go. Not, okay. Uh, let's see here. We will find, let's see, hold on. Uh, here's the living Buddha, living Buddha of Gold Mountain. That's another Buddha. Here's a bunch of Sangha. These are Buddhas in the flesh or the Buddhist team. These are soldiers of the Buddha. You could think of it that way. Uh, more soldiers of the Buddha. Zen master Uchiyama Kosho. If I don't find what I'm looking for in just a moment, we'll switch off the search here. This is a teacher of the Buddha. one who teaches about the Buddha, that is to say. Uh, maybe I removed it because people said, don't put it on your screen, it's sacrilegious. We'll, we'll show the Buddha's hands, okay?
okay, the Buddha in meditation, the Buddha's name. All right, I don't have the Buddha image I was looking for. So asking you the question, what do you see when you see the Buddha? How do you know that you can recognize him? Well, this is a worthwhile question. And some people would say, uh, let's, uh, oh, okay. Some people would say, well, uh, Buddha's probably a man. He's probably meditating. He's maybe sitting under a tree. Maybe he's got his eyes closed. He's uh, got a light around him, another light around his head, two different circles of light. What else do they say? Oh, he's got those, they call them the 32 special hallmarks. You know, the strange, he's got long earlobes, got curly hair, knobby hair, and a uh, thing on his head. If you were to open his mouth, you'd count 40 teeth. <laughs> there, excuse me, sir, would you please open your eyes? Let's say, uh, 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 uh. no, you don't do that. Um, those 32 hallmarks, everyone from antiquity agrees that uh, Buddhas all have those special hallmarks. And when you look into them, they're, some of them are kind of weird. He's got webbed, his fingers are, and toes are webbed. So the Buddha as amphibian. Other things, skin like gold, gold colored skin subtle qualities. Um, okay, if you see someone who looks that magnificent, maybe you too could be like Ananda, the Buddha's cousin, who, when he saw his older cousin looking so splendid, he said, hold my appointments, I wanna go look like him. Whatever it took to get him that way, I want to look that way myself. And he did. He followed his older cousin to leave home and become a Buddhist disciple. That's Ananda, the, the disciple with the best memory, who apparently, to all, by all reports, looked splendid himself. So how are you going to recognize the Buddha? How do I recognize the Buddha? The, if you look through history, I'm, I'm not gonna do a slideshow. I considered that, but I thought I don't wanna use all the time that way. Every culture has a different view. We, if you look at a lot of Buddha images, you can recognize, oh, that's a Tibetan perspective on the Buddha. Ah, that Buddha image looks Japanese. We recognize a Japanese approach. Ah, look at that. That's a Thai style Buddha. Very ornate, different, lots of curling. Ah, look at that. That's so obviously a Chinese Buddha. It's golden, very solid, and wonderfully amazing. You can find Buddhas that look like they were walking down the street in Rome or maybe Paris. You can find Gandhara Buddhas that look so Caucasian, so Western already, so European, so Central European. Ah, they don't look Asian at all. And yet, clearly, they share similarities with all those other images I mentioned. So what do you suppose an Australian Buddha is going to look like? First Australian Buddha. What's the first California Buddha going to look like? You can consider. But the point I want to make, and before I make this point, we're going to read the next passage. 
of boilerplate from the text. What have we established? Our bodhisattva has now seen many hundreds of thousands of millions of nayutas of Buddhas because of his or her cultivation of what is called the Huan Xi Di, the stage of happiness, has brought this bodhisattva image uh, uh, face to face with these Buddhas. Now the sutra goes on to tell us what he does or what she does having met those Buddhas. What happens next? And this is very telling. Shi yi da xin, shen xin, gong jing, zun zhong, cheng shi gong ya, yi fu, yin shi, wo ju, yi yao, yi che zi sheng, shi yi feng shi, yi yi gong ya, yi che zhong sheng, yi ci shang gen, che xi hui xiang, wu shang fu ti. He worships and reveres them all with a great mind and a profound mind. He attends upon and makes offerings to them using clothing, food and drink, bedding and medicines, all the necessities of life, offering them all up. He makes offerings as well to all the members of the Sangha and he transfers these good roots entirely to unsurpassed Bodhi. What's the point? When this bodhisattva sees Buddhas, he immediately enters into a relationship with them. This bodhisattva is, although he's a beginner on the 10 stages, he is quite an advanced cultivator. This bodhisattva is holding the precepts purely for a long time. He's transformed desire. He's a meditator, so He's able to control a lot of his emotions, transform them, not afraid of anything, fearless now, and much delight, much joy in mind, uh, and has been so inspired by the Dharma that he's heard that he's made vows and said, this is, I know what I'm gonna do. Uh, I'm gonna become a Buddha. And because of the practice this Bodhisattva does, he's, been able to see living beings, see us, with a very, what would you say, uh, straightforward, no-nonsense, clear vision, kind of like a doctor. Bodhisattva is not confused by living beings, and instead says, wow, these, these people, in order to become a Buddha, I have to take them from affliction, but man, oh man. They are deeply attached to their confusion, right? Remember that section? Bodhisattva sees them clearly and says, yep, those are the ones who I'm going to work on, work with. Those are the ones I want to take across. So with, this is not a beginner, even though in terms of the course of study that the Bodhisattva has embarked on, he is, this is the first stage. But the first stage is not far from the top of the 52 bodhisattva stages. It's number 40, right? 40 to 40 to 50. All right. What does the bodhisattva do? He says, look at those Buddhas. I'm going to make it possible for them to cultivate worry free. That's my new job. I am going to be a Dharma supporter, Dharma protector, uh, a donor to these Buddhas. That's my new relationship with, these, with this source of wisdom, the light of compassion. I'm going to provide them, and it specifies, food and drink, clothes for the seasons, bedding, it says, but that means shelter, whatever that is required. And then medicine, as needed. Those are called the four requisites. It says everything that these Buddhas need, the Bodhisattva is going to provide for them. And then it says all of the goodness that comes to the Bodhisattva from being generous and supporting the spiritual well-being of the Buddhas 
the Bodhisattva gives away again. This is a week, gee, it's been a long time since we've uh, had this refrain. Take a look. It says, he makes offerings, oh, I left out a line here, which is, the Bodhisattva not only makes offerings to the Buddhas, but also to the Buddha's disciples. Those images I showed you of the, the uh, team Bodhi, team Buddha, uh, the Bodhisattva supports them as well. And then, this last line, transfers those good roots entirely to unsurpassed Bodhi. Okay, that's specific code language. To transfer entirely to unsurpassed Bodhi. Would one person out of a hundred know what that means? If you didn't, if you hadn't been listening to our lecture series, if you hadn't studied the Avatamsaka, probably not. What it means is, there's, let me unpack this image. To transfer entirely to unsurpassed Bodhi all of the good roots. Hmm. That really is code, isn't it? That needs a key. We got to unpack that. What that, how do we understand that? It means that by giving, by being generous this way, the Bodhisattva is creating merit and virtue and blessings. All three qualities, quantities, come to the Bodhisattva because of the generosity that he does. So giving has a reward. And that reward is invisible good stuff. Call it money in the bank account of good things. Investing in a good life for the bodhisattva. It's true that if you are generous in support of others, particularly what are called high or supreme fields of blessings, sheng fu tian, you get a supreme reward. Now, good to aid the homeless, good to feed animals, but if you take your effort, your strength, your time, your mindfulness, and give to beings who protect the Dharma, that is sublime gongzo, merit and virtue. The Bodhisattva gets that stuff and then does what? Gives it away again. That's the second piece of decoding, the second key to this decoding. Transferring entirely unsurpassed Bodhi, right? Bodhisattva doesn't say, oh good, I'm gonna support every Buddha I can because I get lots of blessings. That's true, but he doesn't stop there. She doesn't stop there. She says, every bit of goodness that comes to me for the goodness that I do, I give away to who? To living beings with whom I want to take across first. Because that's the way I become a Buddha. Yes? Make sense? All the pieces fit in the puzzle there? That's the code. What we've seen there, we have a, actually there's a Captain Midnight secret decoder ring. Not really, but there's a, uh, uh, a key to the puzzle here, a piece to the puzzle, which is called Samantabhadra Bodhisattva's 10 Practices and Vows. If you think about what just happened, the Bodhisattva gave to the Buddhas and then transferred the merit, that is vow number three and vow number 10, right? It is. Of Samantabhadra's 10 practices and vows, that's two out of 10. And they are key to the Bodhisattva's path. These are pieces of the education that the Bodhisattva was receiving in along the path. It's called Guangxiu Gongyang, making offerings extensively and Pu Jie Hui Xiang, giving it all the way in transference, sharing the merit. Now, for that to make any sense to us, we have to understand this real stuff, that the merit, the blessings, the virtue, invisible, yes, but real, real.
real stuff. And the giving away that the Bodhisattva does is equally real. And when living beings receive it, the results are equally real. Now, uh, night after night after night at Gold Mountain Monastery, we would see Master Shenhua. Shifu would be lecturing, and he would, you know, he would lecture 10 minutes, and he would say, and the translator, one of us, one of us, our <coughs> volunteers, would hit the Sony tape recorder, stop, roll it back, don't stop, play. Shifu's voice would come again, and we would stop, translate, another sentence, stop, translate, another sentence, stop, translate. We would put into English what Shifu had just said, using the available technological tools of the time, these Sony reliable workhorse trans, uh, tape recorders. And then we would fi finish that section, and Shifu would say, have you finished? Now, between his saying, translate for me, and are you done? Shifu would be sitting there actively doing something. And you see the hands in, here in meditation posture. But Shifu would be sitting on the Dharma seat, and sometimes he would be doing mudras, you know, other times he would have his palms together, other times he would blow, uh, other times he would be reciting something, and as far as I know, nobody ever said, Shurfu, what are you doing? <laughs> I don't think anybody ever did that. Shurfu, what, what's going on? Because uh, was, it was too awe-inspiring, you know. Didn't want to interrupt him because he was obviously working but Shifu was using his particular set of Dharma practices that he alone mastered. I also don't know if there's anyone to whom he passed over, passed those, those tools over. But nonetheless, Shifu was busy and he would always finish with a that, Ani Halameha, and it looked, it, we talked about it, and it seemed like Shurfa was transferring here of whatever he had just done. He was giving it away. And I, have, I haven't asked Dharmaster Chur, I suspect my, my senior in the monastery, who watched Shurfa do this longer than I did, years longer, I suspect she would say Shurfa was doing what Shurfa did something like that because he didn't this was his his special practices but he would do them right there beside us while we were translating and not wasting a second of time and my understanding is when Shurfa was not on the Dharma seat there at Gold Mountain he was doing the same so as long as he was awake he was cultivating and transferring merit to help his thousands and tens of thousands of disciples worldwide. And I saw occasionally the results of that action that Shurfa was doing. And now I didn't, you know, again, you don't say, Shurfa, did you make that happen? What did, what, did you do that? You wouldn't ask him things like that. But I remember when uh, Craig Bach's daughter, uh, to whom Shurfu had given a piece of candy, I think I've told this story before here. Uh, her name was Gofang. She was about four, cute as a button, and she would accompany her parents to the Buddha Hall in the evenings, and she would look for uh, her little buddy, Shari, uh, and the two of them would play, giggle, and, and run around. 
very cute. And then on the weekend, she'd be there for the whole weekend having fun. It was great to have two little girls uh, enlivening the, the Chan Hall, you know, running around, making a lot of noise, being naughty. It was cute. So uh, Shurfu would have them memorize things. And he would say, Guo Fang, you've been a good girl. And he would hand her a piece of candy. And, and Shari the same. Well, one day uh, after the lecture, we were in the dining room around the corner preparing to start a class. Sure, who was going to lecture on another text at the blackboard. And somebody came running in from the Buddha hall and said, Sure, sure, come quick. So we all ran into the Buddha hall, and here was Guo Fang choking. She had inhaled the candy, and it was stuck. And she was blue. You could see this, she, had, she had lost air long enough that she'd changed color. And Shifu, just like a general, said, all of you recite the Great Compassion Mantra now, he said. We're all, namo hula dana dole, namo And Shifu didn't touch the little girl. He sat back and did something, you know, whatever. And he said, recite sincerely, he said. And, da, 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 da. and then Guo Fang went, <coughs> out came the candy, shot across the room, you know. And she's, <gasps> and sure who looked at it, there were, five, there were five of us there. He said, good thing you've all memorized that mantra, huh? He said, giving us the credit. You know. And so you could see that, that, you know, he said, Guo Fang, don't be so greedy for candy <laughs> next time. And he gave her another piece of candy, you know. And she he said, you eat that when your mom is there. You know. So what happened? I don't know. I don't know what happened, but I saw something happen. And to say that it was we five reciting the Greg Abashan mantra, it was what Shurfu was doing. So here is an example of taking those good roots and transferring them. In the case of the sutra, it's to say for unsurpassed bodhi, meaning I want all these living beings to take what I'm giving them and add it to their amount of merit so that they can have wisdom and compassion and blessings and become Buddhas. Then I can become a Buddha because of the vows that I've made. So that's unpacking. That's where unpacking that text. If he transfers those good roots entirely to unsurpassed Bodhi from making offerings to so apply that to you all, to me too. If we offer worship and revere those Buddhas with a great mind and a profound mind and attend upon and make offerings with clothes, food, drink, bedding, and medicines and giving them away and to the Sangha, do we have good roots we can transfer? You bet, you bet, we do. Let's listen to the language of this. This is the boilerplate. This comes up every Every time at the end of each of the new stage, second stage, third stage, fourth stage, this, this text ret ret returns. Fozi zi pu sa yin gong yang zhu fu gu de cheng de cheng jiu zhong sheng fa yi qian er she she qi zhong sheng wei bu shi ai yu hou er she fa dan yi xin jie li gu Xing Mo Shan Tong Da Shi Pusa Shi Bolomi Jung Tan Bolomi Zeng Shang Yu Bolomi Fei Bu Xiu Xing Dan Sui Li Sui Fen Sui Fen Disciples of the Buddha, this Bodhisattva, because of making offerings to all Buddhas, obtains the dharmas for accomplishing living beings. Using the former two attractions, he gathers in living beings, that is, by giving and kind words. 
as to the latter two dharmas of attraction, because he only uses the power of faith and understanding, his practice is not yet skillfully penetrated, these. That bodhisattva among the ten paramitas emphasizes the paramita of giving. It is not that he fails to cultivate the other paramitas, but he only does so according to strength and proportionately. What's that about? So you'll notice that we have mentioned dharmas for attracting and gathering in living beings. What is that? So we're talking about the bodhisattva path, not the path of the arhat or the solitary Buddha. When our bodhisattva starts to see all these Buddhas appear, what do they look like? We ask that question. They are not alone. Buddhas are almost always surrounded by countless numbers of living beings. Buddhas are not bachelor Buddhas. They're not lonely. Buddhas are always surrounded by beings who want to get close to learn the kind of liberation and freedom and joy and light that those Buddhas display. They're magnets for living beings and including non-humans, including ghosts, including asuras, Vajra Dharma protectors, these awesome spiritual warriors, all kinds of beings gather around Buddhas. So I want, I'm saying this so we can adjust our image. I think many of us, when we think, gee, uh, he, the Bodhisattva sees countless numbers of Buddhas, how many of us had this in mind? How many of us had this in mind? Chances are if we had this one, the weathered, aged, black Buddha, we were closer than this chubby Maitreya holding the globe. That probably didn't have that. If we had in mind this one, well, we've been to too many Chinatowns. That's, that's you know, money. Yeah, money. I think Buddha and money. No. This is much closer to what our bodhisattva is seeing. Look at that. Here is a Gandhara style Buddha with a mustache. Look at that. Isn't that interesting? Buddha with a mustache. Right? Look at the hair. Yeah. So uh, they're not, my point is that if we th saw the Buddha alone, like a statue in a museum, probably not the way the Buddhas appeared. Buddhas are front Vajra Sutra materials. Let's see if we can get it. There we are. Here is probably much closer to uh, the real situation. Like this. Devas flying by overhead. Take a look at the devas here. Here's the deva making an offering. Another one flying by. Who else is here? Big shoes. Ah, this is the monks. These are the left home disciples. You can see their personalities. Who is this? Here's a bodhisattva. Might be great strength, might be Guanyin. Who else is here? Kings. 
kings from the human realm, looking all distinguished. Who's, these are attendants. This might be the king's daughters or ministers. Who is this? This is a spiritual Dharma protector. See his fist in the air? That might be a yaksha or a rakshasha. Could be a dragon. Here's the Buddha. Look who else is here. They let lions or dogs <laughs> or lion dogs into the Dharma assembly. There are two of them. They're here flanking the Buddha. Look at that. Definitely an animal. And who else? Here is Venerable Subhuti making his Dharma request. But what do we see? We see, wow, crowds around the Buddha. Look at that. Just jam-packed with living beings. And the Buddha himself is here to, oh, that's definitely a spiritual being. Look, he's got pointed teeth holding a Vajra pestle, looking scary. He's there saying, do not mess around with our Dharma assembly. We want the Buddha safe. Here's the Buddha with a mustache, long earlobes. He's got a, what's called a one character, a swastika on his chest. Yeah, hands in a mudra, blessing Subhuti. Teaching, teaching Dharma. Yeah, that's probably much closer to what is really going on when you see a Buddha. But our Bodhisattva wants to create a wholesome, giving relationship. He wants to support the Buddha so that he will have a chance to hear the Dharma because this Bodhisattva has made vows to teach living beings. If he doesn't hear the, what the Buddha explains, how is he going to come up with what he needs to teach living beings? So the Bodhisattva knows how to uh, learn. He learns by establishing this relationship where he is supporting wisdom. That way in the future he knows he will have a chance to hear the Dharma. That's the benefits of planting a field, you can harvest the crops. You plant a field of blessings, those blessings come to you in the future. Good? So far so good? Now, okay, the Dharmas for accomplishing living beings, look at that. Former two attractions, giving and kind words. Latter two dharmas of attraction. This bodhisattva hasn't got them yet. What is that about? So there are said to be in the dharma four particular ways that should we want to make our vows come alive, should we want to fulfill our vows, that's what I was looking for. There's a, that's a Buddha. Okay. Should we want to fulfill our, our vows and we want to draw living beings in? There are four methods the Buddha advocated for doing that. One is giving, generosity. Two is what's called ai yu, word for word, loving speech. In other words, kind words. Speak kindly. You will catch people's ear or catch their hearts. They'll come back and listen if you speak in a kind way, giving them encouragement, words of support. This bodhisattva is good at those two. He can be a generous and easy to be with. People like him, her, because they speak kindly. Those are the first two giving and kind words. Interestingly, at this stage in our boilerplate progression, gradual progression up the ladder, this bodhisattva can't use the other two. What are the other two? One is collaboration, working together, 同事, 
And the last one is service. Li Hum. Working together and working in service. That takes more Kung Fu, more skill than our Bodhisattva has. How about that? Sounds familiar? Let's see, rhythm sound good. Okay, uh, that's what I want. Uh, that is a Buddhist tune that has to do with giving. Saduna Sanya Sanputo Jujuna Kajuduto Namjuli Juli Junti So. different from hearing me talk, 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 right? So what is that? That's the result of having been given to. That is a song that monks and nuns sing every day that we receive offerings of food at lunch so that we can live on from lay people. First thing we do, I think this is so interesting. I was looking into, back when I was finishing up the lectures on Guanyin Bodhisattva, I touched on Junti Bodhisattva. Junti, sometimes spelled Kundi, C-U-N-D-I, Junti in Chinese. Junti Bodhisattva is, they say, a transformation, a transformed body. Guanyin Bodhisattva. Junti Bodhisattva has alternately four arms, six arms, eight arms, 12 arms sometimes. Um, and has many of the same vows as Guan Yin. It's a separate bodhisattva with a different sutra. Uh, she's called Junti Fomu, the mother of Buddhas, is one of Junti Bodhisattva's name. Also a female, interesting. And along uh, with our 10 small mantras that we recite every morning in our Zao Ke, our morning chanting, we say, uh, Nagarjuna Bodhisattva, Shisho Gei Su Shi Di, Tomi and Ding Li Chi Zhu Zhu, Wu Jing Sheng Zan Da Jun Ti, Wei Yun Si Bei Chui Jia Hu. I bow my head. Shisho Wei Yun Chun. Chi Zhu Zhu to the mother of seven kotis of Buddhas. Let's see. Shisho Gei Su Shi Di, Tomi. I bow my head to Jun Chi Zhu Zhu, Wu Jing Sheng. I praise Jun Ti Bodhisattva. May she come kindly and compassionately uh, bestow blessings on me, on us. And then you say, Sadonan, Samya, Sampatua, Jujanan, Dajutua, Nan, Juli, Juli, Junti, Sopoha. That's the Junti Bodhisattva mantra. And we do that as one of our 10 small mantras. So, what about that? Every day after lunch, we go, Sadonan, Samya, Samputo, Then 
Then we add one more verse at the end of the Jujunti mantra, so wei bushujo bi huo chi li yi. They who practice making offerings will certainly obtain their reward. They who take delight in giving will later surely find peace and happiness. Uh, now that the meal is over, Fan Shri Ichi Dangit, may all living beings uh, in everything that they do be perfect and full, and full in every Buddha teaching. May all things that they do lead them to the perfection of the Buddha's teaching. So that's the wish that we give back having been offered to. It's a very elegant and graceful custom that when we receive from others that we immediately think to repay with blessings, with the goodness that comes. So here's an example of the daily life of monks and nuns in the monastery are tuned to this bodhisattva path so that the goodness that comes to us, we don't consume ourselves. We don't take it to the bank. We invest it in living beings, banks, so that we all progress along the bodhisattva path. So there's an example of the sutra's principles coming alive in daily practice in the monastery. And our, this is interesting because we can clock the progress of the bodhisattva. At this stage, first stage, only can handle two out of the four methods of gathering in. We progress there. as we enter our sophomore, junior, and senior year of the Bodhisattva's Academy. Never mind the other eight, the other six. Uh, we begin to master all four of the methods of gathering in living beings. Hmm. A little more here. Shi Pusa Sui So Chin Xiao Gong Yang Zhu Fu Jiao Hua Zhong Sheng Jie Yi Xiao Xing Qing Jing Di Fa So Yo Shang Gan Xi Yi Hui Xiang Yi Che Zhi Di Zhuan Zhuan Ning Jing Tiao Rou Cheng Jiao Sui Yi Kan Yong That formula repeats every, every one of the students. What this Bodhisattva diligently cultivates, the making of offerings to all Buddhas, the teaching and transforming of living beings, and all good roots from cultivating the dharmas of purification to stages, he completely transfers to the stage of all wisdom, omniscience, becoming progressively more bright and pure, subdued, compliant, and accomplished, and capable of acting in accord with his intent. <coughs> This passage repeats. This is, we're hearing it for the first time and it continues. What this Bodhisattva cultivates, you could put a colon right there, that is to say, making offerings to the Buddhas, teaching living beings, and learning how to purify all the different stages, meaning master all the different stages, all that stuff, this Bodhisattva gives to one goal. The stage of, it says, Ichi Di. What is the stage of all wisdom? That's Buddhahood. Okay, so he's giving all of this good stuff away. Compare that to the greed that says, oh, I want all, all the stuff I cultivate, I want it all myself. It's mine, after all. I, I worked for it, I deserve it, it's mine. You cultivate your own. Don't ask me to transfer merit. What would that be based on? That would be based on 
a self that can have things. That would be not the wisdom of the Buddha. The wisdom of the Buddha arose because he emptied out the self and gave everything to others. Hmm. Okay, so this, there's a principle here. This is consistent, isn't it? Why would you want to hang on to the merit compared to the goodness that arises when you give this stuff away? Because we know every act of generosity erases a little bit of the self. Um, had an opportunity yesterday to watch uh, a uh, uh, younger brother and an older sister. The older sister is uh, four now, and the little brother is not quite two. Well, I guess the younger the sister is five. And the younger, so we were uh, had some snacks, and they were pumpkin seeds, and little brother got a little napkin with some pumpkin seeds and he liked the pumpkin seeds and he was like that the five-year-old older sister reached her hand over to take some of the pumpkin seeds and the little brother was like mine he was unhappy that his older sister had reached her hand in and we were all like whoa this happy little boy just the nubbin came out with a, you get your hands out of there, those are mine. We're like, where did that come from? He's like, yep. And both the parents are so tuned in to the kid, they say, yeah, we have to teach him. Yeah, it's good to share with your sister. That's, it's, you'll be happier if you could, can't you have one? You know, why don't you give one to her? You know, very skillful response. But from that, not even two-year-old entity called little brother, little chao di di, Wow, mine! He owned those pumpkin seeds because they were on his little napkin, you know. And thought, yes, there it is. That's what the Buddha transformed. How many of us go through our entire lives no more progress than that not even two-year-old boy? Mine! All mine! So you have entire political parties whose only platform is giving all the money to rich people and taking all the money for rich people. That hasn't progressed at all from this two-year-old who, who was willing to fight his loving big sister. And the two of them are friends ordinarily. But as soon as he had something, where do I see that? I see that on my balcony with the birds. Oh my, we have the little colorful birds called lorikeets that have the same attitude. Any food put down anywhere is theirs. <laughs> we have three different feeding stations, three, three different places where the bird seed goes. And there are six birds on the balcony. There are five lorikeets or six lorikeets and then six kinds of birds. Then there's, there are pigeons, and there are kookaburras, and there are currawongs, and there's cockatoos. And I put seed in all three different places. The lorikeets will divide. Two go to this one, two go to that one, and two go to that one. And then they look out, and they eat as fast as they can, pointing out. Anybody comes close, ah, like that. Ah, they, they get their back up. And you think, come on, you can't take all three feeding stations. You're just the smallest birds here, but you, are, you own all three. That's not an evolved mentality. It's not a mentality that shares. Uh, and you say, well, they're only part of the animal realm. You excuse them. Well, there are other birds, king parrots, who happily back off. They're not aggressive. They will wait, they will watch. And when the other birds fight over the bird seed, they go in and quietly take a little bit, you know. So yeah, we humans shouldn't aspire 
to the greed of animals. We should inspire, aspire instead to the joy, which is called the stage of happiness of the bodhisattva. And watching the parents of the little boy yesterday, they are going to bring out from the nature of their little animal child, not quite two years old, 18 months, they're going to show him that happiness of giving. I suspect it won't be another year or two when he will offer some to his sister because his parents are going to encourage him, teach him, show him how happy it is when you share, when you give. But what a boy, what a uh, little boy was speaking Dharma, they say. Sherpa would say, Yiche, Yiche, Dozai Shorfa. Everything is teaching us the Dharma. So we got one more image here. Um, what is it like? We got one more passage and then we're done with the text today. Go on with some stories. Fozi Piru Jin Shi Shan Chao Lian Jin Shuo Ru Huo Zhuan Zhuan Ning Jing Tiao Ro Cheng Jiu Sui Yi Kan Yong Pusa Yi Fu Ru Shi Gong Yang Zhu Fo Jiao Hua Zhong Sheng Jie Wei Xiu Xing Qing Jing Di Fa So Yu Shan Gan Xi Yi Hui Xiang Yi Che Zhi Di Zhuan Zhuan Ning Jing Tiao Ro Cheng Jiu Sui Yi Kan Yong Disciples of the Buddha, for instance, when a goldsmith skilled at smelting gold repeatedly puts it through the fire, it becomes progressively more bright and pure, supple, pliant, and accomplished, and capable of being worked in accord with his talent. The Bodhisattva is also like this. He makes offerings to all Buddhas and teaches and transforms living beings, all of which is cultivation of the dharmas of purification of the stages. Then he takes all the good roots, completely transforms them, transfers them to the stage of omniscience. Thus, he becomes progressively more bright and pure, subdued, compliant, and accomplished, and capable of acting in accord with his intent. Isn't it nice to hear the, the English work, you know, sutra as literature, to hear it flow. This is what we're trying to do here. So, what do we say? The Bodhisattva, uh, all of the things he cultivates, making offerings to Buddhas, teaching living beings, and cultivating the dharmas that purify the stages, he transfers. And as he does so, the bodhisattva becomes progressively more, this is the, the repeating, this is the refrain that we get 10 times, more bright, more pure, more subdued, more compliant, more accomplished, and capable of acting in accord with his intent. Look at that. Let me unpack that. What does it say? Sui Kan Yong. This says, this is the first stage bodhisattva. He has, she has made many, many vows. Can they do them? Not yet. They're not able to act according to the vows they've made, but they're, they know they're going to get there. On this first stage, the bodhisattva says, that's where I'm going. I can't get there yet. But the more he or she gives, the more generous they become, the more they transfer, transfer, they become more able to do, to practice what they preach. Now they can't yet. They can preach it, but they can't practice it yet because why? Bad habits. Their mind is not bright yet entirely. There's still dross there. And then our sutra gives us this really memorable image. Here is the Avatamsaka Sutra giving us something unforgettable. What is it? He says, what's it like? It's like a goldsmith who is really good at jewelry. And what does the jeweler do? He takes the gold and puts it in the fire and then bangs on it some, turns it, bangs on it a little bit. And the gold becomes progressively more workable. And it becomes closer to 24 karat. The, the, the goldsmith is then able to turn it into, you know, rings and benvenuto cellini, who can make the salt cellar that you find at the, at the Louvre, right? Uh, the, you can put it in a crown for a king or a queen. 
Uh, you can do all kinds of good things with the gold once it's been fired and pounded and refined. At first, the gold is still rough. At first, the bodhisattva is still rough. He can't do what he says he wants to do yet. But the bodhisattva is also like this. He makes offerings to Buddhas and teaches living beings, which is what you do when you purify the stages. Then you take those good roots and you transfer them to omniscience, to all wisdom, and you, like the gold, become progressively more bright, more pure, subdued, compliant, accomplished, and able to act the way you want to. You, can, you get better at holding your vows. I like that image. That's so clear and memorable. And somehow I recognize that. How come when I say I want to do these things and I can't, something comes up, my mind scatters, I lose mindfulness, ah, I need to be pounded more by the goldsmith. I need to be more generous and uh, do more transferring of merit. So we are coming into Christmas time in Christian countries, in countries where Christmas has become commercialized. We've come there. And where would we find the Bodhisattva? We would probably, ah, let's see now, let's start over. Where would we find the Buddha and how would we recognize him? I'm gonna suggest that we would probably find the Buddha doing something like, say, oh, I saw the Buddha today. That Buddha that I saw was taking their Olympic silver medal for the javelin and auctioning it off to fund heart surgery for a child. Polish javelin champions won the silver medal in Tokyo, heard that a child was undergoing dangerous heart surgery, couldn't afford it. She took her silver medal from the Olympics and auctioned it off to the highest bidder. She got something like 180,000 euros for it and uh, somebody bought it back and gave her the medal back. <laughs> what does she look like? What would that person look like who was doing something like that? Uh, that person would look like look like, not like Piggy. would look like this. This is the face of somebody, Maria Andrejic, auctioned off her silver medal, $125,000, used the money to save the child's life. And uh, a Polish supermarket chain bought it, uh, paid for it, gave her the medal back. Be good. You say, I think I saw the Buddha today. He was an elementary school principal who works a night job stocking shelves at Walmart to pay for homeless students books and clothes. That's where we would find the Buddha. You think the Buddha is sitting up there on the altar? Well, he is. But the Buddha has many transformed bodies and he looks like this. That's what he looks like. Henry Darby lives in North Carolina, South Carolina. By day is an elementary school principal. At night goes to work at Walmart from 10 a.m., 10 p.m. to 7 a.m., stocks the shelves at the local Walmart. Uh, by day, day job, principal of North Charleston High School. Every penny from his Walmart paycheck goes to his students, 90% of whom live below the poverty line. 
in America. Uh, he says, I get a little emotional because you got children that you heard are sleeping under a bridge or a former student and her child sleeping in a car. He says with tears in his eyes, these people need, I wasn't going to say no. At my age, we don't ask for money, we just don't. You just go ahead and do what you need to do. At Walmart, he never told the store manager about his day job as a principal of a school. Uh, so, uh, and Cynthia Solomon, his boss at Walmart says, even before we knew there's something special about him, he's ready to help anybody. He's there when you least expect it, but when you need him the most, he's there. Darby doesn't seek praise. He says, I don't think I've done anything worthy of distinction to warrant the attention. He just hopes his students, whom he calls his grandkids, will pay it forward. It's quite simple, he says, learn to help others. That's one of the greatest things we could do in terms of human beings. So there's somebody whose gold has been refined and polished and shines. So those parents will be teaching their young son to bring that out. I think I saw the Buddha today. He was a cancer biologist identifying a compound that turns off the gene that causes cancer cells to metastasize and spread throughout the human body. Metas, see how we can spell metastasize. There we go. Look at this. There's a Princeton team successfully found the compound that disables the gene that causes cancer cells to spread throughout the body at Princeton. Uh, the cancer biologist named Kang Yi Bin, Chinese researcher, 15 years of research has gone into metadarin, met metadarin, metadarin, or MTDH, the gene that produces abnormally high level of proteins and allows cancers to flourish and grow. The silver bullet now discovered by the scientists can effectively deactivate the function of that gene even after the tumor has grown into a fully developed life-threatening cancer. Scientists hope to be ready for clinical trials in human patients in two and three years. Even though metastatic cancers are scary by figuring out how they work, figuring out their dependency on certain key pathways like MTDH, we can attack them and make them susceptible to treatment, says cancer biologist Kang Yibin. All right, maybe that's the Buddha. I think I saw the Buddha today. She was molding small soap scraps into a larger bar to save waste. Do you do that? Take up all your little soap scraps and compress them, hold them tight, keep them warm, and then making them one? Otherwise, they go in the trash. I think I saw the Buddha today. He was melting down statues of generals to make pieces of peaceful art, celebrating humanity's best side. This is happening in Charlottesville. I think I saw the Buddha today. He was delivering toys to a thousand kids who lost their homes in a tornado. A gentleman from Michigan did just this this week. The tornadoes that ripped through eastern Tennessee, uh, western Tennessee, all those kids lost their homes, no toys, at Christmas. So a gentleman from Michigan made it his job to give some joy to kids. I think I saw the Buddha today. He was joining, she was joining her local Buy Nothing group promoting circular gift economy to reduce waste, particularly plastic waste of all kinds. This is fascinating. There are groups now that are, let's see if we can find that story. There are groups doing something called buy nothing. They have determined that they can do better if they share what they already have. 
Sharnetta Barnes moving house when a friend mentioned to a Facebook group where people were giving away all kinds of things, signing up for her neighborhood buy nothing group. She found the furniture and kitchen supplies she needed but couldn't afford. Barnes is part of a growing movement that started in 2013 as a local network of circular gift economies, but now has 4.3 million members in 44 countries. While Liesl Clark and Rebecca Rockefeller funded Buy Nothing with a focus of reducing plastic waste, its mission is as much about promoting abundance as it is about buying less. There's so much out there, Clark said, from raw materials like vegetables to manufactured goods headed for a landfill or goodwill. So look into Buy Nothing groups that celebrate abundance. We have so much indeed. So what does the Buddha look like to you? Interesting. Maybe not just the, the, uh, the figure sitting in full lotus. Buddha's that, but Buddha's also have tennis shoes that are worn down at the heels from all the running they do to help other living beings wake up. Uh, we have a uh, annual custom which is celebrating our Buddha carols, singing along. Join me, if you will, those of you who know. Oh, Western land of utmost bliss, how pure we see thee lie. Your lotus flowers give birth to us our karma purify. The vows of Amitabha, the one of limitless light, saves everyone who says his name, reborn in pure delight. Western land of utmost bliss. Now this one you can all sing along, because we all know this melody. Ready? Silent mind, holy mind, all is calm, all is bright. Deep Vipassana thoughts rise and fall with Clear insight detached from them all. Sit in heavenly peace. Sit and contemplate. We got to do that again. Ready? Silent mind. It'll do you no harm. Holy mind. All is calm, all is bright. Deep Vipassana thoughts rise and fall. With clear insight detached from them all. Sit in heavenly peace. Sit and contemplate. Indeed, indeed. We got one more. This is gratitude to our sitting cushion. In the Zen world, we say, Shikantaza, Chirguandazo. You want to thank your cushion for the wisdom that it teaches you when you, con you only pay attention to your sitting. So, our Zabaton, that's the name of the cushion. And usually it's stuffed with kapok, right? Or some sort of fiber. So we say, this is, O Christmas tree, O Christmas tree. O tanambam, O tanambam. Ready? O zabuton, O zabuton, thy kindness is substantial. I sit upon thee day and night, 
with folded legs and ankles. Thy batting saves my knees from pain. Through hot and cold, you don't complain. O Zabuton, O Zabuton, compassion's insulation. Don't you feel more festive, joyous? I'm sure you do. If it has moved you to give, <laughs> maybe you're going to give up listening to sutras. That's what you're going to give. You're going to give up listening. Yeah. So no more of that, right? Okay. So my very favorite, I want to share one more before we ask uh, Jin Chuan or Jin Wei to tell us about activities at Berkeley. There was a uh, television series years ago called Studio 60 on the Sunset Strip. And it only had a brief run, but it was a very well-written show. And they did a Christmas show, which had, uh, they, the show was set in the time when um, Katrina, hurricane, swallowed the city of New Orleans. And of course, New Orleans is the home to a lot of the most beloved of American music, including jazz. And many of the jazz musicians who lived and worked in New Orleans had to flee. They, you couldn't live in New Orleans. So they found themselves, some of them found them their way to the West Coast. And a group was formed around a musician named Trombone Shorty. Uh, that was his, that's his jazz name. His name is Trent. Trombone Shorty formed a, a brass uh, quintet and uh, some of the best jazzmen in New Orleans. And they called themselves the city of New Orleans. And for the show, Studio 60 on the Sunset Strip, they hired these jazz musicians to give them something to do because they were homeless. Uh, having Their home had been taken from them. So on this show, uh, Trombone Shorty and his group, the city of New Orleans, played O Holy Night. It is unforgettable. So I wanted to share just a little bit of this. One of my favorite moments from a uh, television show ever. Here it is. I'll increase our share computer sound. Here we go. So Merry Christmas, everyone. Happy Buddha holidays. This gets me every single time. It just goes right to the, you gotta hear the climax. We, we can't listen to the whole thing, it's too long. But the uh, trombone shorty hits a D flat at the end of this and it, I follow the comments of everybody on YouTube and everyone is saying, boy, I just teared up every time. They listen every year for this. It never fails to, to bring tingles to your spine. Okay, here's the conclusion, trombone shorty the city of New Orleans pick up New Orleans Brass Band. Here we go, last minute. <laughs>
Uh, you can find that on YouTube, uh, Studio 60, Oh Holy Night. Go look for it. All right. Uh, I would at this moment like to ask Jin Chuan or Jin Wei Shi to let us know. I'll bring up Berkeley Monastery. What's going on? Anything over the holidays? Hello. Can you hear me there, Master? Hi there. Yeah, please do. Jin Wei Shi. Okay. So, yes. Uh, yes. As uh, I'm sure mentioned, we're entering to the holiday season. So, you know, so at their view, Dharma and Buddhist University, uh, just uh, finished the autumn semester. And so with some classes, I will have a break, like Friday night, the Avatamsaka Sutra by uh, Professor Marty Verhoeven. On Wednesday, Stephen Tainer. I take a break and uh, continue the teaching, I think, start at, uh, in January. We'll announce exactly when. And we are following our the daily, uh, daily schedule. But tomorrow, actually, it's an important uh, lecture by Rabbi Heng Shur, if I'm right. Right, their master? At, yeah, that's a fact. Mm. It's here in Australia, it's 1.30 p.m. Um, this is the Sunday night lecture at City of 10,000 Buddhas. In California, it's 7.30 p.m., here in Australia, it's 1.30 p.m. afternoon. Taiwan, China would be um, two hours earlier. Um, it's on, let's see here, you can join either by Zoom, uh, you can hear it in Vietnamese, or you can join on YouTube. Uh, for Chinese listeners, probably Zoom is the way to go. So there's, here's the meeting ID and the passcode. Okay, Jim Wisher. Yeah, and uh, we continue our daily practices in our virtual Buddha hall, starting at uh, early morning, 4 a.m. We have morning ceremony, followed by meditation, three steps, one bow, and daily reflections. We have noon recitations, and our elder monk Jin Forsher is happy to, to chant with everyone, Buddha's name, and evening ceremony. So. And we don't know yet, probably we we'll have uh, some retreats and Buddha recitations uh, near future, we'll also update you. And, and of course we have, uh, in the end of the, each month, we transfer the merit from the recitations of uh, Great Compassion Mantra dedicated to this uh, current pandemic. So you can find on the website, if you want to join and recite, join the group, it's opportunity. It dep depends on you, how many communication mantra I want to chant. And if you have any questions, you can just yeah. uh, email us. I'm, I'm scrolling around trying to find my way to your daily schedules, but it's been, anyway. So you, you explain. It's probably somewhere down, down. I, I we have scrolled down to the bottom and I got. Uh, down the bottom, yeah, we went to. So anyway, yeah, but people just do do what he said, not what I'm showing you. <laughs> Pay no attention to the monks scrolling here. There we go. Ah, that's what I'm looking for. Okay, here we are. This is the daily schedule. Okay, great. Okay, thank yes. you, Jim mm -hmm. Thank you. That does Everyone. it. Thank you, Master. Amitofo. Yeah, good. Okay, there we go. So. Uh, if you, wherever you are listening, like us here in Queensland, are uh, anxious a little about the Omicron variant and what it means, especially when it's timed to relaxing all of our former precautions like border closings and, and mask mandates and stuff like that, um, having that website to turn to is a help. So to find some things that never change, like the opportunity to recite sutras and mantras and bow and listen to reflections in the Dharma and find community with friends who are doing the same thing, that's good. That's a good thing to do. So I want to invite all of you to that. So my talk tomorrow at 1.30 p.m. is on um, pure land practice in the West in particular 
translating the Avatamsaka, the Mintaba Sutra. And what it, what's it like to be coming from a uh, theistic perspective with a god and then to meet another one, a Buddha named Amitabha? How do you separate that feeling of, hmm, I don't want another, you know, uh, kind of patriarchal figure telling me what to do. That's why I learned to meditate. Now you're giving me another one. What, what's this about, right? Well, there is a story to learn, the story of the Pure Land. So that's what I'll be talking about tomorrow and the following Monday as well in Australia, Sunday night in North America. Okay, here we go. Uh, oh, let's see. We're to, I'm ahead of myself here. We want to transfer the merit first. And we've got our Medicine Buddha Mantra, which is right here. This is our tool, our power tool for, uh, from the Mahayana tradition for dealing with illness given to us by Medicine Buddha. Medicine Buddha's mantra. So let's recite it together and transfer our merit. Here we go. the time to bow to the Buddhas. If you care to join me, we do three half bows. Bow in respect to the Venerable Master. That's going to do it for us today. We'll see you all next week, and happy holidays, everybody. Omitofo. Bye-bye now.